All right, we are at one past, so we'll try to get things started. Um, everyone is ready for AI to save us from the keynotes. Wait, no, that came out wrong. Uh, everyone's excited about AI, and so now, rather than looking forward to the future of technology, it's time for us to acknowledge that we've got some fun things that will be with us for a while. So, um, what are we going to be talking about today? Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time saying, why are we talking about end of life and end of support? Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time doing what we always do in security, which is admiring the problem. Gosh, that's a nice problem. Uh, and then we're going to tentatively talk about what a path to considering a potential direction for a solution might look like. Uh, so the, the bad news is I am not going to say, here is how we are going to solve this issue. Um, the other note in advance that I'm going to tell you is for those of you who know me, it's going to look a little bit like what we talk about already. And if you don't know me, my name is Alan. I'm from the government, here to help. Uh, but more importantly, I'm the guy who doesn't shut up about SBOM. And where we're going to head is going to look a little familiar, which is to say we're going to propose some data layers that can then support risk layers. So how do we move towards thinking about data that we can use and then make sure that that data is separate from our policy and action decisions, but make sure that it is built to inform that line of thinking. So let's start off by talking about old things. And I see Bob Martin is in the front. No, wait. The, uh, so right, how do we, so think about how old your cell phone is. We learned that our VPN appliances are old and getting older, right? We've got, once we start moving into infrastructure, we're getting even older still, right? your cell tower, your industrial control systems. Once we move into the national security system, we've got a hard problem. So Alex is in the front row. He is using DevOps tools to maintain 40-year-old airframes. Right? You've got a lot of legacy tech out there. And it's everywhere, right? In our homes, we're learning that we've got lots of home routers. Uh, they're end of life. By the way, you'll notice it's very small font, but even if you could see that and read that, nothing on that tells you what to do except the line that I've highlighted, which is, by the way, you should replace this. And what happens if you don't replace it? Well, whoops, a national adversary is going to use it to attack critical infrastructure. So it is a problem. We can go into automotive. I love this old tweet from Mudge who said, hey, brand new Mercedes comes with a wildly outdated library. So the punchline that he set, up, set us up is, your brand new Mercedes essentially comes pre-owned. So many of us tracked the recent Avanti model. Look at the age of the equipment in here. We're using five-year-old, 10-year-old, 22-year-old software for things that are security critical and sitting on the edge of the internet. Not a good thing. We need to have a better way of doing it. And of course, because it just happened, everyone needs an XC slide in this entire track. I think it'd be a shame if anyone were to be in SupplyCon not talking about XC. But again, it gets to the idea that we're tracking the age of things. This is a big problem. According to the Wall Street Journal, someone came up with an estimate of $1.5 trillion. So in case you were worried that I was going to stand up here and say rip and replace, we're not going to do it. Despite what some of the large vendors would like us to do, we are not going to buy all brand new technology. There's no money to do that. And in the software that we all depend on, that we all work on, Right, we know that maintaining that gets harder. This has been floating around since like IRC days 
of when I wrote this code, only God and I knew what was in it, and now only God does. And what I love is just, this is a new piece that I found when I went looking for this quote, which was, please track how much time you spent wasting on this out-of-date code base, uh, and we can update it there. So, okay, we're all familiar with the idea that things are old, they're getting old, and that's bad. Well, why is a random bureaucrat from Washington standing up here and talking about it? It's because we finally said, okay, we need to do something about it. And so this is from the United States National Cybersecurity Strategy, kind of the fundamental foundational document that has been shaping cybersecurity policy in the United States and globally for the last few years. And it says, we're going to develop a process for identifying and mitigating the risk presented by unsupported software, widely used and in critical infrastructure. So where's our focus? It's on the things that if they break or bad things happen, we're talking lives, we're talking national security. How are we going to do it? Well, by the time it got filtered into the National Strategy Implementation Plan, someone took some things that a random junior technocrat in DC told a bunch of White House people over drinks, and that got turned into the, well, let's have a centralized database for that. Now, um, I think most of us in security learned that centralized databases don't work all that well. Uh, and building a new one is not terribly credible, but at very least, we're going to start talking about what it is that we're looking for. And the other reason this is a priority for the United States is, uh, so this is my boss's boss's boss, Eric Goldstein. He is the cyber in CISA. Uh, and he said, by the way, you know, when it comes to out of date technology, the United States government might in fact be the worst actor in the world in terms of how much we have. So, let's talk about software. We'll start with proprietary software. I know, not quite the spirit, but it's important to acknowledge that that's where the dollars are right now. Um, proprietary systems get old. And the expectation is not, and never will be, support them forever. Uh, trying to figure out what it's going to look like is quite tricky. So there's a push, for example, in Europe to say, well, when you start selling something, you need to say how long you're going to support that. I don't think that's terribly fair in many markets, right? If I start selling a new fridge, I don't know if six people are going to buy it or six million people are going to buy it. It's probably going to change the economics of my long-term support idea. By the way, when we talk about support, boy, is it tricky in terms of what we're talking about. So we've got end of life, end of renewal, end of expansion. Uh, I think IBM may use that term as well, which is to say, well, we're not making any new stuff and we're not selling any new stuff. But if you already have a bunch of blade servers, we'll help you fill out that slot because that's just free money. We're not going to end that. And end of support, end of maintenance. There are lots of terms out there that are problematic. And then it comes the time to sort of predicting, okay, well, when should we stop doing this? And you got a couple of options. You can sort of say, okay, I'm going to try to build a spreadsheet and McKinsey is going to fill in a bunch of random cells that will tell me, all right, for this new product based on this market, we're going to support it for this long. And maybe they're right or maybe they're not. Hopefully the McKinsey consultants washed the numbers off before they put them in the spreadsheet. Or you just say, yeah, we're kind of bored with this. It's not making us money. So everyone, you got a month left. Neither of those are really an optimal model for predicting it. But the important takeaway here is there isn't really a magical path forward. And once we start getting into the safety world, it gets even harder. So, as near as I can tell, the best international standards around end of life and end of support come from the medical device community. And this is understandable, right? The blinking box that's keeping grandma alive, we've got to actually understand when I can no longer count on that actually keeping grandma alive. Now, I'm 
didn't put this up here so you can read it. It's obviously far too small. The important thing to pay attention to is those big open-ended arrows at the end, which is to say, hey, and by the way, this is the bottom of end of support, guess what? There's still some expectation for risk management. There's still some expectation for thinking about this. What is that expectation? That's the part that's not in the fancy international standard. And then, of course, who is going to pay for it? So a couple of months ago, last year, someone popped the island of Guam. The entire telecom network was owned. And it turns out that the major telecom provider was using out-of-date software. And there was a decent amount of consternation among both major telecom manufacturers and major ISPs of whose fault is that? And the answer isn't going to be everyone buys new stuff as soon as there's no longer support. And the answer also can't be the people who make the thing support it in perpetuity. And so that's one of the sort of core takeaways here is there's not going to be an easy solution. It's got to be some mechanism to negotiate between those two end positions. The other core takeaway I want to emphasize is EOL is risk, but it is not vulnerability. Right? There is nothing, something can end support today, and it doesn't mean that I have massive, someone's going to own my network. There's going to be an exploit tomorrow. There are other risks, and we'll spend some time talking about that. What do we actually care about? So we need to know risk awareness. We need to understand responsibility. Obviously, we need to worry about patches or updates. Thinking about the response, whether it's a formal P-cert or a less formal vulnerability disclosure process and enabling planning and risk smoothing. So all of these apply to all software right now. But after all, we're at the Open Source Summit. Some of the problems are easier in open source, some of them are a little harder. So the maintenance stuff is pretty similar, except the challenge is, one, no one's paying for it. That's the bad news. The good news is that people can start accepting money for it and not necessarily the original funder. And that is, I think, one of the things that we need to sort of embrace and explicitly consider when we're talking about open source is that something can be end of supported and then supported by a different actor. And we'll talk a little more about that. The expectations are also a little trickier, right? Open source software is provided as is. I think for those of us who aren't native to the open source community, one of the most powerful essays on this was written in Christmas last year by Thomas DePierre. It's just a simple blog post that said, I am not your supply chain. Whoops. But it really should have been, I am not your censored, censored, censored supply chain, right? It was not a polite blog. It was an attempt to have a wake-up call. And I think it did have a huge amount of impact. And Thomas, to his credit, is not a DevRel person for a giant tech company. He's just someone who said, I need to make sure that the community understands things. So we know that this is part of our supply chains. And so as we think about end of support, one approach is to look at the projects themselves, but we also need to explicitly consider the users of software. So OWASP has started this. They have their top 10 open source software risks. 
Number four and five are unmaintained software and then out-of-date software. Uh, both of them are great, important to acknowledge, but at the same time, what they don't do is say, what do you do about it? I don't always love to cite industry studies, uh, especially when they're sort of from scanning tools, because there's going to be a certain challenge of how that data is collected. But I think this is a useful one to cite, which is of the scan code bases that Synopsys looked at, 91% had at least one component that was 10 versions out of date. And we can quibble about, you know, is this version a.b.c.d, or is it a.b, but still, that's pretty impressive. And the other piece is just saying, hey, some of this has just been code that has not been touched in two years. We'll talk about how to interpret that signal in a moment, but that's one of the ideas. So back when I was first studying software security and the economics of security back in the early aughts, we spent a lot of time talking about whether software is like milk or wine. Does it get better or worse with age? Uh, and there were some people who tried to argue that actually uh, it got better with age. And some people said actually a dynamic code base is the best defense. There are very, very clever economic models that were completely divorced from any empirical reality, but that's the joy of writing the joy of writing economic models on a whiteboard is you don't need data. But there's a fun article, a uh, fun study that ChainGuard just published that just basically said, OK, if I'm looking at just containers, what's the risk of CVEs based on how old they are? So this is, uh, there, this is from the ChainGuard blog post. And first, the core point there that you should pay attention to is the application itself didn't have a lot of vulnerabilities, right? It was in the fact that all containers have a mass amount of other software in them. Dependencies are a problem, sysa.gov slash sbomb. But the core point is, if you're using out-of-date software, you'll regret it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but someday, and for the rest of your life. So what else should we think about other than security? Uh, one is just instability, right? As software ages and it gets more complex, I'm going to pile more on it. The likelihood of coming up with an unexpected use case, unexpected inputs, unexpected uh, relationships is going to go up. There's a reason why even without security uh, updates at all, Maintenance exists and is important for all software. We're always going to find new issues and new challenges. Second is technical debt, right? Someday you're going to have to pay the piper. Well, maybe after I exit, maybe after I leave the company, these are fun things, but at a certain point you're going to do it. And then of course, there are legal, legal obligations. Does anyone work in the national security space? So just a couple of hands. Uh, DISA Stig says all software must be maintained. There is a rule from the, the, the properties and the controls that govern national security space that says the software that you're using has to be maintained. PCI says you need to have software updates. You need to check for them. And if none are available, I would argue it's pretty hard to check for them. And then there are more controls there. Now, again, in proprietary world, there's often going to be public announcements of, is this maintained? How do we think about whether or not a given package or a given project is even alive? Well, for mature projects, this is something that folks are paying attention to, right? They have releases, they have predictable dates, they have commitments. This is wonderful. Uh, and this is definitely something we should be looking for. But we can't always take advantage of this, right? Not everyone, uh, not every package, and almost certainly things that in your supply chain don't have these properties. 
So what can I look for? Well, scorecard has started down this road, and a bunch of people, right, Bob Martin's working on a system of trust of what are some of the signals of whether or not this code base is secure in general, and in, specific, in particular, what we're talking about is how do we maintain it? So one is just numbers of maintainers. Everyone loves stars and forks. We can look for recent activity. How many issues opened? More important, how many issues closed? Uh, security communication. OpenSSF has done some great work about pushing, uh, here are some policies that you can have. In 2024, there's no reason that any company or project or even, dare I use the word hobbyist with Ariadne in the room, uh, can't have a vulnerability disclosure policy, right? We, we all understand it, and it could be don't care, go away, but we need to have that as a public signal. But even this stuff is kind of tricky. Um, is even. How many issues are going to be opened in is even? How much code velocity should we expect in a 10-line function, right? It's not going to be solved. So determining exogenously whether we can count on something to be supported is tricky. All right. Everyone now annoyed that end of life is a problem, and gosh, we should do something. And thank goodness Alan is here to tell us what the solution is going to be. We're, we're not going to do that, but we're going to sort of propose one of the directions forward. And I'm going to work very hard to make sure that we've got at least a few minutes at the end to talk about it. So the high-level approach is data to support policy. And the fundamental architectural distinction is to separate the data from the policy while still making sure that how we think about that data is it can inform our policy. And by the way, by policy, I mean both the Washington DC form of policy and the left coast, I'm implementing infrastructure as code, et cetera, et cetera. So we mean both term, both use of the word policy. We've already spent a lot of time, hopefully everyone's on the same page with me now, of saying the solution isn't to rip and replace or say absolutely no outdated software. I also think we should be very clear that we shouldn't try to shovel some things into our solutions for this. We're not going to try to address the fundamental economics of software. If you want to know more about the fundamental challenge of the economics of security, come and talk to my CISA colleagues and I and the Secure by Design team. Um, we even have our very own chief cyber economist here. Uh, so there's a lot to be done there. We're not going to try to fix all software. We're not going to tell open source maintainers what to do. And always important to remember this, about once a month someone says, well, can't everyone just use Semver? And Yes, I would love if everyone used it, but again, the one thing we learn in thinking about global scale software is you're not going to get everyone to do what you want. And any solution that begins, everyone should just do what I do, is not a credible path forward. So, what are we trying to do? We're trying to have purpose-driven transparency the ability to understand what our exposure and our risk is. And again, this is starting to sound familiar. Who wants to say it with me? It's going to look a little bit like... Okay, not completely. But keep that as a potential mental model in your head, which is to say transparency is a starting point but it won't by itself fix our problems. So we're going to start with definitions. Uh, I decided not to give you all of the different definitions of end of life, end of support, and all the other terms that I put up earlier. There are a lot of them. Many of them are written by lawyers. God, I hate lawyers. 
But one of the things we can do is try to flip it. And rather than talk about end of life, from a security perspective, let's talk about what we mean by active security support. And so this is the best that I've been able to come up with. We're going to spend a lot of time trying to workshop this. It looks similar to some things out there. So first is I need a reasonable expectation. That gives me a lot of wiggle room. But I still need to have some evidence about why I'm doing it, right? It, this is, I have this belief, and it's a reasonable belief. The second is there's going to be a response to a new security risk. Now, new we can quibble about. But, and the response doesn't have to be patch it. There are other responses we can have, but there needs to be a response to security risk. And again, I'm not using vulnerabilities exclusively. There are other types of security risk that we may care about. So let's keep it open-ended. And then the final middle piece is also important. It needs to be effective. I can use it to meet my security needs, and it needs to be predictable. I have some idea of what it's going to look like. Happy to throw this back on the screen when we come to Q&A, and you can tell me all of the problems about why that's a terrible definition. So now let's talk about the data. We need some information about the what, the who, and the when. The when's easy. It's a time frame, and it's a status. Right? Supported, not supported, open to the idea of having other states in there. The what is the target. That gets tricky. I'll talk about that in a moment. The who is also one of the novel things that we need to think about for open source, which is unlike, you know, big company that makes a piece of software, the who is almost always going to be that original manufacturer. Whereas in the open source model, we can have the idea of third-party support. Some of you may remember Dan Gere's famous Black Hat talk, A Modest Proposal, where he says, hey, anything that you're not supporting automatically gets open sourced. More and more people keep returning to that idea, by the way. I should also be clear that I am not formally advocating that concept as a representative of the United States government. But if you haven't, go check out Dan Gere's 2013 Black Hat keynote. But the core here is we need to be able to allow anyone to assert the support status. And that's going to get tricky, but that flexibility will also allow people to defend their decisions and build it into their risk calculation. Now, the what is also pretty tricky as well. Um, this is not a talk about software identity. Rest assured that software identity, if you've not bumped into this, is a very hard problem. Uh, CISA and MITRE wrote a lovely paper admiring just how hard a problem it was. The short version is there is no easy solution to identifying software that works for everyone. Uh, and everyone has a solution that says, this will work for me, and that's great. CPEs are great. Perls are great. Omnivore is great. Software heritage IDs are great. Hashes are great but we're not going to get one model to work forward for it. So when we think about the who, we're going to need to have this idea that third parties can come forward. Now, are folks familiar with VEX? So VEX is a horribly named project. That's my fault. Uh, it stands for Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange. And essentially, it's a way of communicating the status of whether or not a given soft piece of software is affected by a vulnerability that may or may not be in their code. It's a very powerful idea because built into that is the idea that anyone can make that assertion. And we push the responsibility of trusting that assertion downstream. That's not optimal. This terrified a bunch of big tech companies when we first talked about it. 
but it does give us that flexibility of incorporating the security research community and third-party vendors, which are increasingly a vital part of our software ecosystem. I also want to, again, coming back to the idea of SBOM, acknowledge the idea that end of life is dynamic data. And it's always important when you're thinking about an architecture model to separate static data. For example, in an SBOM, if the software doesn't change, the SBOM shouldn't change. There are some edge cases, but that's the general model. Whereas vulnerability data and end of life data will change. Things were secure until those pesky kids pop shells, right? So the other piece here is that it's going to be machine readable, right? If we're not building things for automation in 2024, we're doing it wrong. So it's got to be automated, automated friendly. It's got to be built on these concepts. So we start with our definitions and then we embed them in our JSON. We need to have translatability. So again, starting to say, okay, well, this works for this sector. And in this sector, this concept that they're already using, we'll use that term as well. And then the ultimate goal is to be integrating this into our existing risk frameworks, our existing risk policies, our existing risk controls, and of course, our tools. The good news is that there's already been a marker put down in this space. Some of you are familiar with OASIS. It's an open standards group. Uh, they've got a lot of cool things happening. It's where the common security advisory framework happens and things like that. Um, they've been about to get started for about a year now. Um, so one of the reasons I'm going around and giving this talk is to nudge this. Um, one of my colleagues at CIS is the co-chair of this, along with Omar Santos from Cisco. Uh, there are a lot of major technology companies that are behind this in different sectors. So as this moves forward, there will be the opportunity to get involved. Uh, and um, Oasis is structured, and one of the reasons they're using GitHub to track their practices is so that anyone can be involved, even if you're not an official member of Oasis. Uh, happy to chat more about this project, but that's really where, you know, we've got the machine readability part is the one that's covered. Um, so now we have the question of, okay, I've got the concepts. I've got the metadata. How do I find it? That's pretty hard. So if you're not familiar with endoflife.date, this is a great website. Uh, had a chance to meet the maintainers, maintained by one guy in India. Had a chance to meet him in Brussels uh, in February. Super nice guy. I think, uh, let's see, this is 302. So they recently crossed 300 projects. Um, who uses more than 300 projects in their software? Yeah. So uh, this is nice and also it's heavily sampled on the largest ones, so that's important, but it's also the ones that are using, uh, that already have this sort of publicly declared end of life approach. So they are centralizing the data that's out there. Centralized databases don't work in security. Um, they worked in security in the late 90s when there were, you know, 50 software companies. We have a few more now, right? I like to joke, everyone in the world is a software company. Law firms are software companies. Don't believe me? Look up Panama Papers. Uh, so what we're going to need is a path forward for aggregation and federation. This starts to be a familiar problem for those of you from the security advisory space. But again, what I don't want to do is reinvent brand new solutions, but try to help converge that. So let's use some of the similar approaches that we're starting to have for security advisories. Uh, and maybe that means two separate types of data that are aggregating. Uh, so for example, in Vuln space, we've got the NVD and we've got OSV. And neither one is perfect. Boy, is neither one perfect. But we're going to, right, we're, we're, the world is now based on being able to use both of those. 
All right. So wrapping up here, this is uh, Dan Lawrence paraphrasing General Mad Dog Mattis, which is be polite, be professional, but have a plan to update every piece of software used. And the last caveat I want to sort of make sure that we have is as we build out our policy framework, we should acknowledge that updates can't be the only thing that's on the table for a whole bunch of reasons. And so we need to do a better job of building this into our top-down policy and our bottom-up risk frameworks of being able to think about what we care about. And it could just be explicit inclusion. It could be I'm going to ask my threat intelligence person to let me know. I'm going to build a custom kill switch so that I can yank it off the network the second I know things. There's network segmentation. There's a lot of other things that we can do. There is, God forbid, backporting. Uh, there's a lot of other things we can do. So as we think about other considerations, again, end-of-life data is important. We should use the lessons from vulnerability data, but we shouldn't try to treat it as the same. And we should always acknowledge how that data is different and how we're going to use it differently. If we're going to have a world where we allow anyone can to, to contribute information, and again, here, the model can be VEX, it can be OSV, there are other areas where we've learned lessons of what happens when anyone can declare something that is security relevant, and we can figure out how to trust that. And by the way, this goes all the way back to commits. XZ informs every talk this week. Um, but we need to explicitly consider it. And then the last piece is one of the things that I think is the most important as we think about tech policy. And it's a lesson from evolutionary biology, which is you need to be able to tell a story of what half a wing looks like. If your model says, assume that everyone is doing it from day zero, you're never going to get any adoption because you need full adoption to get the benefits. So we need to be able to start telling a story of how people can get benefits with the first tranche of adopters and how that makes us better off. So what are the next steps? Well, you are now at the first talk that CISA has given on this topic. Uh, don't tell RSA. Uh, and we're going to be doing things like exploring definitions, talking to the critical stakeholders from our perspective, which includes medical devices, energy, operational technology, things where lives matter, and of course, the open source world, because everyone depends on that. Open EOX is going to launch very soon. Uh, if you want to know more, happy to make the intros, or you can go check out their Oasis website. And now, really, I have, I think, oh, I only have one minute left, alas. Uh, so if you have a better idea, now is the time to very quickly shout it out so that everyone on the webcast can hear it. <laughs> We've got one vote for a central database. Better ideas, that's true. Uh, so, so the question was, why shouldn't this be part of the SBOM regime? And I think a big part of that is because it's going to move and evolve a little differently. Um, and again, when you make a piece of software, you may not know the end-of-life models. And similarly, there, it will change in your supply chain in real time. And so if someone downstream has your SBOM, but the underlying mechanics have changed, it gets a little difficult. I feel the same way about vulnerability data in the SBOM, which is if it's inside a single organization, it totally makes sense to just put all the data together. But if you are assuming a multi-hop multi -hop flow of data and there's no way to guarantee that it's being updated, it gets very messy. And so that's why I want us to move to an architecture where we have 
uh, different data that we can link together. And so what we do have in common is the identifier question, or the software naming question, and the software identifier question, and things like that. In the back. So, so the, the question was, can we just have a baseline or an expectation or just a general best practice? This is how long support should live for. Um, tricky to do globally, right? My substation is probably going to have a different expectation than a Lambda function uh, of how long I expect to be able to use it without revisiting it. And so that's one of the challenges. I think it's wonderful to have more best practices around for sectors, for chunks of technology, right? Uh, but I, I, I don't think it can be universal in a way that is useful. Is, but what we can do is tie those best practices to things that we've talked about today. Definitions, machine readability, explicit understanding of what the risk calculations mean for that corner of the tech world. Uh, someone who is actually running the room should tell me when it's time to get off stage. Those of you who know me know that I will talk for a very long time. There's another question in the back. Yes. Love that question because I think that sort of drills straight into the unique issues in open source. Uh, one thing that we've seen promulgated by folks in the open SSF is the idea of declaratory policy. Can you always trust that? Maybe. Uh, I think that's one path forward. The other is looking for some of these signifiers, right? Code velocity, pull requests, stars and forks, etc. Um, you have a, something you wanted to add to that? Uh, yeah. Um, so with the XD uh, attack, you know, uh, a key element of it was basically the uh, effective harassment that the maintainer in order to bully him into uh, accepting GSM, whoever he actually is, uh, as a uh, maintainer. Oof. You know, were these merge requests, um, you know, actually like possibly malicious and that sort of thing? And that was like a whole fun experience. Um, Thanks. So, or I mean, give me a second. I'm just going to summarize because I, I don't think the mic picked up. Uh, so you raised two huge points, which is one, the idea that not all software, especially low-level software or relatively compact software, isn't going to be updated frequently. And two, the XC example was triggered in part by people pestering uh, the maintainers and so saying, hey, there should be more, and that's, that's a, a vector itself. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, so basically, uh, we need to think about these things as being uh, approach the problem of security and that and uh, is kept secure. Um, the other point I was going to make about uh, federation of security data was you brought up. Uh, you know, we have SDXD and things that, you know, these other things that are in alignment with that being brought by Jesus. So, uh, 
Cool. The, so summarizing briefly, Alan needs to go learn a lot about Activity Hub because that allows, excuse, excuse me, pub, excuse me, thank you, uh, because that is a mechanism that allows uh, JSON data formats to cross communicate and collaborate. All right. Um, the next talk is at 10 of or at 12? Five of. Okay, then I think maybe time for one little question and then I'll surrender the stage. Alex. Mm -hmm. So particularly when we talk about security, um, like I refresh my cell phone, not because I stopped its functionality dead, but its security updates stopped. So when we start to get into Internet of Things, where we're getting um, smart refrigerators, smart microwaves, and these things that we don't necessarily want to have on the network when they stop updating, it almost seems like it's an opportunity to try to force the acceleration of consumer consumers buying new devices, particularly when you had things like televisions originally had a lifespan of 20 years, and now you're seeing that, oh, well, now we only support updates for three years, and then all the apps drop off, and then you don't get security updates. I agree completely. Like, a lot of our focus has been, so the, the question is, what about IoT and planned obsolescence, and how that touches on things like e-waste uh, and other core values? Um, I agree. I think a lot of the attention and the power is going to come from long-term durable goods uh, in critical infrastructure. For the consumer-grade goods, this is a huge problem. Um, uh, they've lagged in security pretty much across the board, but I think the brand new tools, the brand new devices now are a little more secure, are a little more stable. That's one hope. I'll also put in a plug for something that's, I think, going to be launching very soon. Uh, from folks uh, like Window Snyder and, and Weld Pond and some of the at stake folks, uh, the Cyber Resilient Future Foundation, which I think is going to be looking at this idea of how do we make sure that we aren't building uh, inherent fragility into the ecosystem uh, with an emphasis on the devices that touch our daily lives. All right, that's my time. Thank you so much for yours. Uh, happy to chat more. Uh, if you need to reach me, sbomb at cisa.dhs.gov, find me on social media, or I'm led to believe that if you look in a mirror and say sbomb three times, I'll just appear. So uh, let's chat more. Thank you.